thing God wants from us is not a particular attribute, it's not a particular skill, it's not a particular level of spirituality, it is a person. The purity that God wants from me, the honesty, the integrity that he wants from me is a person. And that person is Jesus. What he wants from me is Jesus. That's what he wants. And my likeness to Jesus will determine, my likeness or uh, unlikeness to Christ will determine my eternity. It'll determine, it'll determine whether or not God looks at me and sees what pleases him. And nothing pleases God but Jesus. If I can get anything across to you tonight, it would be that. Nothing pleases God but Jesus. You and I being right about anything has nothing to do with anything. And boy, we bank a lot on being right. We bank a lot. We Christians bank a lot on being right, having the right stance on this issue, having the right, um, having the, having the right thing to say, having the right song, having the right sermon, having the right suit, having the right car, having the right denomination, having the, having the right, uh, being right. And God is not impressed with you being right about anything, especially about another Christian. Nothing interests God less than you going like, uh-huh, uh-huh. You want to get yourself in trouble with God, go to another person and bandy about their faults. That is death. You begin speaking death into a situation when you begin speaking of another brother or sister's faults because what you feed is what is going to grow. What you feed is what is going to grow. My question is, what's growing in your garden? What's growing on your tree? Is it good seed? Because good seed and good soil brings about good fruit. Bad seed brings about bad fruit. So uh, without, well, there's no counsel, people fail. But in the multitude of counsels, there's safety. There's no wisdom or understanding of counsel against the Lord. The Lord has, has established a kingdom, and it stands on his wisdom and his truth and his grace. That kingdom is very much superior to any earthly one, as its king is superior to any earthly king. You're not better than anybody else. Your God is better than everybody else's God. Amen? So, so let's not get it mixed up and get it twisted that, that, that anything that I, that I have or own or any position that God has given me, even the authority I walk in, makes me any better than anyone else. That's not the point. God doesn't give you authority so you can be better. God gives you authority so that you can humble yourself and he can use you to help others through the authority he's given you. Okay, God doesn't give us authority so we can walk around being authorities. There's enough of them out there. <laughs> There's enough spiritual authorities out there who know a lot. But the scripture says very clearly, if anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. It says that in 1 Corinthians um, um, 8.2. Um, I'm sorry, Monica, I didn't get you that one. But, um, but if, any, if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. Uh, Paul says that. It says that. So we, when we come at, at each other with knowledge about anything, that knowledge in God's mind is, is you, God's not enriched one bit by what I know. Right, right. And the only way you're enriched by what I know is if I take what I know and, and I minister to you with it, if I bless you with it. If I, for instance, if I know your shortcomings, um, what, am I, what do I do with that? What do I do with that? That is a test of where you are spiritually. What do you do when God shows you somebody else's faults? Or when God shows you somebody else's mistake or somebody else's issue or somebody else's, anybody here got issues? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> you know, think about one thing about Christians is, is, is the, the, the ratio is one to one of Christians with issues. Okay? <laughs> In Proverbs it says, who can say I've made myself clean? I'm, 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 I've, I've washed, I'm free from clean from my sin. Obviously, it's a rhetorical question. Nobody can say that. On, Pastor, right. Nobody can say that. So you are saved. You, you're being saved, and you will be saved. And he who endures to the end is saved. So since all of us are in the same boat of needing a Savior, then any time we... Anytime we take the opportunity to speak into another life, it ought to be done with tremendous gravity. Just tremendous gravity. 
because what you feed is what grows. And if you speak God's truth with grace, good things grow. If you speak God's truth with judgment, death begins. Immediately death begins because you're beginning to administer the law of sin and death. You sinned. And what's the result of sin? You either are going to get forgiven and, 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 and confess forgiven, or you're going to die. That, that thing, that, that death starts the minute that we have unconfessed sin and death, the death begins us and, and things die in our lives. But my hope for you and your hope for me, hopefully, is that any sin that gets revealed gets covered, not exposed. It's covered. Will, will you cover a brother's sins or will, or will you expose them? Will you cover your sister's shortcoming or will you expose them? Will you cover your pastor's shortcomings or will you expose them? You see, the reason many pastors don't allow many people close to them is because they get hurt by the people who are close to them Amen. who don't know how to cover them and expose them. Amen. And a man of God really doesn't have much in the way of defensive weapons. I mean, I don't get to shoot back, really. Not really. I don't. That, that's not something I get to do. And so, your proximity to somebody that walks in authority is a God-given trust, for which He will hold you strictly accountable. I've been around pastors my entire adult life, very close to my pastors. I know God hold me strictly accountable for covering them, and not one of them was perfect. <laughs> You, may, you haven't had a perfect pastor either yet. At least not. You, didn't go, you don't have one here. But you probably didn't have one before you got here. You probably won't get one. <laughs> when you get to heaven, you won't need a pastor. You got Jesus. So <laughs> you don't get the perfect pastor. You don't get the perfect evangelist. You don't get the perfect apostle. You don't get the perfect, you don't get the perfect teacher. You don't, you don't get that. What you get is Christ, the perfection of Christ. And we all contribute to that. And we contribute to that through good counsel because good counsel, good counsel will will. will, will Erect uh, will make a place a safe place where men and women counsel and encourage each other. It is a safe place. In this place, the good counsel in this place comes from several reasons. Comes from several reasons. It comes because I encourage you to be in the house and in the word and in the closet and the fellowship with one another. And when you speak to one another, speak carefully to one another. When you speak about others, speak carefully about others, because anything less than anything that's not edifying is just gossip and it's satanic. Who's the accuser of the brethren? Satan. So when you and I accuse a brother of something, whose work are we doing? I'm not saying when we speak to a brother about something or we, we go to a brother about something. I'm saying when it, when, it, when it goes from that to something more, something else, then it turns into the devil's start to have fun with, with, with the church. So we protect each other um, by, by the conversations that we have and the counsel that we give. Because without counsel, the people fall. If I don't counsel you well, there would be places that you fall that you should not have fallen. You would not have fallen had you received good counsel. Okay? If I counsel you well, there are places that you will not fall because you receive good counsel, and you simply will not fall. I've sat under good teaching, and, and I, I exposed myself to good teaching for decades. Um, I stopped listening to pop radio when I was probably about 25, 26 years old. And, and I just, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know any of the songs, by the way, of the late 80s and 90s. Um, I, one of my favorite songs today, you're going to laugh at this, or some of you who, who know this, one of my favorite songs is uh, Return of the Mac. <laughs> and and that, that song came out in the 80s, and it's an R&B classic. I never heard it. And people look at me, you never heard, you, you never heard that song? Don't make me play it, because I'll play it, but... Uh, uh, I want, I want that song played at my funeral, by the way. But anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I, said, I want the pallbearers walking with my, with my casket like that. But anyway, um, <laughs> no, duly noted. I don't know whether my wife's going to allow it or not. But, uh, wait till we get outside the church and then play it, all right? You know, so, 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 <laughs> so, so I, because I turned my radio. To, um, to, to Christian radio to, and, and, and in the 80s and 90s I don't listen to Christian radio anymore uh, just, I, I just don't have the, the, the time for that but 
Um, I exposed myself to Bible study, and I listened for, this, for Bible study, not even the music so much, but the Bible study. And I exposed myself to the, some of the best Bible teachers in the world. Um, uh, and think about radio, too. Radio is better to me for Bible teaching TV because there's no, there's no show. It's just a voice. There's no show. It's just, it's just teaching. No distractions. Just, and I listened to it for years. And that's what I listened to when I turned on the radio. I didn't listen to anything else. I listened to Bible study from, from, from anointed teachers. And, um, and I involved myself in the house of the Lord, fully, fully invested in the music and the word. And I told you I was there so much, they had to give me keys. Every church I went to, they had to give me keys. But the reason I say that is because I received decades of counsel from the pulpit and from personally from my pastors with whom I became close. Personal. Some of it was fun and wonderful to be seen. Some of it was hard. Some of it was hard. For men, the counsel is going to be hard sometimes. But that's why you must fiercely be determined to get it. Because you don't always want good counsel, but you always need it. You know, you want to do what your instincts tell you to do, and there are times when I'm sure that's proper. But the Bible says where there's no counsel, you fail. You fall. But in a multitude of counselors, when you surround yourself with sisters and brothers who love you and who have no agenda for you and want to see God's <coughs> best for you, the more of them you can pile up, the better off you are. <laughs> The more of them, you, you need to be able to name at least four or five gentlemen, brothers, who, who are counselors to you. They're not there to tell you what to do and what not to do. That's not what a counselor does. The counselor does not, the counselor's not your daddy. Okay, your daddy, when, you, when you're little, your daddy tells you what to do and you do it. You're, you're a child, you're under the law. When you're older, you're under grace. But you know what? A lawless person doesn't understand grace. So if you never get that law, if you never allow anybody to tell you what to do, when you get the grace, you never you don't understand it. Because grace, it takes into consideration that you are under the law of God, the rule of God, and therefore God can then show himself through you. Because you're a lawful child. In other words, when your child and, and your, your daddy and your mother and, and raise you well and, and you receive it, they then can release you and trust you when they're not around. That's good. All right? They can trust you when they're not around. And so good counsel does that. Good counsel, when, when I first started receiving good counsel, I was a younger man in my mid-20s. And I mean, my, and, and look, I had a great dad. Uh, but I'm talking about it in, in terms of spiritual counsel from the, from the word of God, teaching me what it was to be a husband, teaching me what it was to be a father, teaching me what <coughs> integrity really meant, teaching me what honesty really meant, teaching me what... what what purity really meant, it was hard. And one of the reasons we run from counsel because it's hard. But that's the reason, brothers, you ought to run to counsel. Because in a multitude of counselors, there's safety. The, the, the great thing about my life, particularly right, right now, is what the Lord's done for me. I, I, I'm not afraid of anything. I, Cody prayed a prayer for me three year, two, three years ago. He said, Pastor, I not, I not only want you to be fearless, I want you to be fear free. I want you to be completely free of fear. I want, you, I want fear to have nothing to do with you, period. And over the years, because I remember waking up in the middle of the night, fearful, and feeling like the, the world was sitting on my chest. I remember that. And getting up and not knowing. And, and, and that's what I had to go through to get to. But that the way you get through to get to is to avail yourself to the multitude of godly men and counselors who will walk with you. You walk up into this. It doesn't just happen. You just don't wake up one day, I'm mature in Christ. Wait, that'd be nice. That's not how it works. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, <laughs> I have already come. <clears throat> there is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. What he's saying is the word of the Lord establishes God's order. 
Anything, any counsel, any conversation that violates God's order is bad counsel. There is don't receive it. Don't hear it. Don't receive it. Any counsel that's against the order God sets up, any counsel against the commandments of Christ, any counsel that does not take into account the kingdom, the church, the way the Lord has set it up, do not receive it. <clears throat> do not receive it. Ever. I'll tell you how stark this is. Dathan and Abiram, and the, the whole, almost the whole tribe of Levites, or a bunch of them, just got into their head that they were as good as Moses. Why, why, why do we keep listening to Moses? Why, you know, why, aren't we Levites too? Aren't, aren't we sons of, Le, sons, of, sons, of, sons of Levi? I like to pronounce it Levi. And the reason is because I had a, a friend, a, a Jewish kid, and then he, he, he's a Levy. They call him Levy. I like that. Aren't we all sons of Levy? I think that's actually the proper way to pronounce it, but anyway. You know, and so you and I always get in trouble with spiritual authority when we go like, don't, don't God speak to me too? Oh, man, really? Do we have to have this conversation? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. If you're in my position, we do. I'm like, I don't, this, there was never an argument whether the people of God hear from God. Who's the one telling you to read your Bible every day? Who's the one telling you to be in Bible study every Wednesday night? Who's the one telling you to get together with your friends and, and have a burrito and, and, and keep your life and keep it? Who's the one telling you all get together? Who's the one telling you, hey, I mean, you need to write? You need to write. You need to write what God's doing in your life. You need to write. You need to write this. You need to, you need to, you need to have your notes and, and be writing. You need to be studying. Who, who's the one telling you? This is my job to teach you to hear from God. And there is no contradiction between hearing from God and walking in the fear of the Lord when it comes to spiritual authority. It's a dangerous thing when you lose the fear of the Lord for whoever walks in spiritual authority in your life. It's a dangerous thing because God did not give some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and buddies. Homies. I don't help you when I'm your buddy. I don't help you when I'm your buddy. I help you when you honor my authority at all times. I've sat on the pastors my entire life. And the reason God kept pushing me forward is because of what I did where I was. Faith was little. Faith was much. I didn't always agree with my pastors. Um, loved them, and we went toe-to-toe -to -toe on some things, but I always knew who the pastor was. Always knew who the pastor was. Never, ever forgot how God uses pastors uh, and, 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 and how what a blessing they are to me. Amen. Man, my pastor's blessed. I get the word of God from those men. I'll fight you. That's I'll right. fight you, you talk about my pastor. <laughs> I'll, fight I'll fight you. I'll fight you. <laughs> I'll fight you. Period. Um, you know, my, I told you about that. I'll tell you this is my, one of my favorite stories of all time, about how pastors operate. Because... I, I, I we went to do worship. It was just me and piano. Big, beautiful United Methodist Church, Westwood United Methodist, right smack dab in the middle of, of, uh, of um, Beverly Hills, uh, outside of Westwood. And big old historic church. They have a two year waiting list for weddings. Okay, because people want to get married there. It's a, just a big old historical <laughs> church. They have, they, they have a nine foot baby grand, nine foot baby grand. Not, there's no nine foot baby grand. It's nine foot grand piano. The, the, the grand, the Steinway. They traded out a nine foot Steinway for a better piano, if that's possible. But they did. That's the kind of church it is. So, and I used to play that piano on Tuesday nights because that's when we had a Tuesday night service. I get there and, and everybody's running around because they can't find the piano key, the, the key to open the piano. Like, what? Hey, we can't find a piano key. It's just me. We won't worship. Just me and piano and, and vocal. And so we're all running around and we can't find the piano key and we're looking for the maintenance man and he just, he wasn't out, we, didn't, we couldn't find him anywhere. 
And and we so it, it got to be, and I was nervous. Everybody's nervous. I'm walking around, and I was in the back of the church, and the Lord said, Eric, go sit down. I said, Lord, I need the key. He said, go sit down. So I, it was a test for me. Rather, I was going to, I knew it was the Lord. You know how you go, well, that wasn't really the Lord. That was just, you know, you know. It was, I knew it was the Lord. And so I went, sheepishly, because everybody's looking at, why are you sitting down? I mean, you got to find the main, we got to find the key. Service starts in, in 15 minutes. I sat down. Henry, the pastor, comes in the door. And, Henry, we can't find the key to the piano. And so we can't find the piano. He said, you take the piano bench? Now I'm mad. Because I thought the other guys who were there when I got there had probably checked. But I, thought, I, I said to myself, yeah. And, and right as soon as he said that, I said, they didn't check the piano bench. Check the piano bench. There's a key. I went to Henry. I said, Henry, that's why you're the senior pastor. We laughed, he laughed, but I meant it. That's why you're the pastor. You know stuff the rest of us don't know. Because God has given some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the edifying of the body to grow you up into the image of Jesus Christ. And, and when you're a true pastor, you're relentless about that. You never, ever, ever let any other agenda take over, ever. You know things that will bless God's people that nobody else knows. God tells you things that he gives you a position. You have the best seat in the house. That's right. Why? Not for your benefit, but theirs. You lay your life down so they can rise up. Amen. Now, God blesses you and, and hopefully and, and anoints you and and give you, and hopefully your people love you and bless you and cover you, and somebody say something about you, they'll fight for you. Hopefully. But it ain't always that way. But for you, counsel comes to you from your pastor. Do not muddy that water. Because if you do, you are drinking muddy water. And it is your fault. If somebody else muddies the water, rebuke them. Tell them what the Bible says, that you are to honor those who are in authority and make their life easy and not difficult. Amen. And you are to give them double honor, yes. double. When you honor them, honor them again. That's what that means. You honor them, honor them again. And you finish honoring them, start, start again. First of all, that starts with your parents. Honor your father and mother. Why? Because you will live long and prosper. Anybody want to live long and prosper? Yes. Honor him. Honor your father. Does he, is he always honorable? Uh, his actions may not always be honorable, but you've already made up your mind about that. You've already made up your mind about that. You don't have to, oh, well, daddy acted, he acted a little out of sorts the other day, so I, uh, I'm going to give him a little attitude. You've already made up your mind about that. <laughs> Daddy's not always right. He's always daddy. Not always right. He's always daddy. And so you just don't go there. You just, and if you do, you have transgressed the law of God. So therefore, the counsel of God now, it says this, there's no wisdom or understanding against the counsel of God. You are operating against the counsel of God, and it will not work out well for you. It will not work out well for you if you take on the powers that be in the world, because the Bible says God gives them authority. And God's going to hold them responsible for how they use that authority. You know, I was upset about, you know, the stuff that's going on the border. God told me, he said, he said, I didn't give you authority over the border. It doesn't mean not to be upset, but you might as well start pulling your hair out, you know, because I didn't give you authority there. But what I did tell you to do is don't be overcome with evil, overcome it with good. Yeah. That's what you can do, overcome it with good. Oh, but you do good. Find out what good for you looks like. Yes, sir. Amen. And by the way, there are places where I have given you authority. 
You can't pay attention to those places if you're paying attention to places I haven't Amen. given you authority. I didn't say don't be concerned about what's going on in the news and don't have it. I, man, I, I, I take you down over some of this stuff. And at the same time, I don't have authority there. I finish, I, I make my flight, I go on about my business and get back to what I do have authority over. And that's the ministry and the family that God has given me. To walk honorably in that and to cover you, to cover your sins as you cover mine. If we get outside of that, then, there, then we're, we're, we are walking in a wisdom and understanding that's against the counsel of God. And there is no wisdom. There is no understanding. There's no blessing on anything outside the counsel of God. So when the Lord you know, told me this afternoon to tell you all to be quiet, it is because we live in a time when there is so, so, so much said that doesn't need to be said. And guilty. And Eric, shut up. Be quiet. Just be quiet and serve me. The Lord told me last night at 3 o'clock in the morning, I woke up at 3.33. I looked up and said, oh, three threes. I wonder what that means. Doesn't mean anything. It means get up and pray. <laughs> and the Lord said to me, as soon as I got on my face, he said, season of song. Season of song. He said, season I'm giving you songs. I want your church to sing. I want you to sing me a new song. We sang one tonight. I want you to sing me a new song. I want you to write them. And I've been doing, I've been diligent to be in that studio. I'm in that studio sometimes. I say, Lord, what am I doing here? Is this, uh, uh, didn't I tell you to make, write me a new song? Yes, all right, then write it and play it and distribute it so the people of God can sing me a new song. I'm deeply grateful for all the musicians, the Christian musicians who've given God new songs. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love them all. Thank you, God, for the worshipers. Thank you, God, for the worshipers. Thank you for all of them. Thank you for all of them, no matter what they what, what, what everything from country worship to, to hip hop worship to whatever. Thank you, God, for, for musicians who won't shut up. But you have to be quiet about that other stuff, and you've got to open your mouth. And, and you, you, you know, you, you've, got to, you've, got, you've got to focus your stuff. You've got, to, you've got to be focused on what God has given you. My counsel to you is be focused what God has given you to do, and the evil around you, you will overcome it with good. You will not overcome it by trying to overcome it. Amen. You will not change anything by trying to change anything. You will not change yourself by trying to change yourself. You won't, certainly won't change America by trying to change it. You can vote for who you want. It's not going to change anything in God's eyes. The nations are, by the way, are dropping the bucket to God. The things we think he cares so much about, he don't care not about that stuff. He doesn't care about that stuff. He cares about you. And if the love of God is going to be shown in the world, it's going to be shown through you. He doesn't have another plan. So if we spend our time fighting battles, we don't get a chance to love people. And it says about the, 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 the church, is it was the Laodicean church? It, it, it's, or it's the church of Ephesus, I think. You have lost your first love. You forgot what was really important. Your doctrine is pure. You, you, you're doctrinally, you are wonderful. You know stuff. You're knowledgeable. You studied. You got your degrees, and you know, you know done. That's what you and you're right about. It. But hey, you don't love anybody anymore. Cold, cold, bony finger in people's face, and that is the evangelical church. They're right. They're right. That's that lifestyle is wrong. That that that's that that's that's wrong. Abortion is wrong. It's, it's, they're right. We're right about the issues. You lost your first love, though. You don't love nobody but you. And people who give you what you want. Transactional. You'll sleep with the devil if he'll, give you, if, if he'll pass the laws you want. You lost your first love. You forgot that I love poor people. And you cannot love the baby in the womb and hate the baby at the border. You cannot love the baby in the womb and separate the baby at the border from his mama. Nobody separates children from their parents but the devil. Read your Bible. Nobody separates children from their parents but Satan. Nobody. Nobody. It, it doesn't even cross a, a good man's mind to separate a child from their mother. 
doesn't cross your mind. It's a demonic thought. But when it's about when, when it's about us, and we lose, we get away from this. So there's no good counsel. There's no good politics. There's no good policy apart from God. So there is no wisdom, understanding, or counsel against the Lord. God loves people. He so loved the world that he that Jesus died. So you cannot not love people and call it God. What are the first two commandments? Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Everything you got. Your money too. Don't throw that in. Don't leave that out. And your neighbor like you love yourself. The same people who kind of look the other way while children get separated, try to separate their children from them. See how far you get with that. It's okay, though, for them. No, it's not. There's no counsel. There's nothing good apart from the commandments of Christ Jesus. And so I say that to you because God wants you and I to, to think, just, just think on a, on, a, on a little deeper terms than what about me all the time? What about me all the time? What about me all the time? The counsel God gives us is so that we can be a blessing everywhere he sends us. Everywhere he sends us, God can trust us with souls and situations. Souls and situations. There's a book coming soon. Finish with these couple things. God gives us men and women along the way, all along the way, who will offer us excellent counsel if we will humble ourselves and receive it. Humility receives counsel and respects authority. Pride does not. And prideful people will fall. They will fall. If they don't, then the Bible's not true. But the Bible's true. Pride cometh before a... Those who receive counsel avoid untold pain and sorrow. And they have the advantage of the experience of those who are wiser than they are. It's a dangerous thing to think you're wiser than you really are. It's a good thing to be wise. But it's a dangerous thing to think you're wiser than you are. And a lot of, and some of us Christians think that. Think that we know what we don't know or we understand what we don't understand. Um, I, it, is, it is not my job to walk into your household and, and, and to, to, um, uh, to walk in authority in your house. I thank you that you respect me when I come to your house. That's Eric's here. You respect me and respect me as your pastor and all that. But I don't come in there and tell you how to run your house. Man, you need to put that, uh, that couch over there. <laughs> <laughs> I think your TV should be over there. Man. Why's, why's your TV over there? Why's your... <laughs> it's not my house. Your house. And, it's you, and I respect your authority in your house. I respect your authority in your car. I respect your husband's your authority with your wife. It's not my wife. I don't correct your wife either, by the way. I correct you so you can correct her. <laughs> I don't want to mad at me. <laughs> I want to mad at you. <laughs> I want you mad at him, Mom. I want you mad at me. You know, so I correct him. He, then he makes you mad. Then that's, that's the way it's supposed to be. You want to be mad at me? I didn't, do, I, I, I didn't say it. <laughs> Barbara talks too much. I'm not going to tell Barbara she talks too much. I'm going to tell Skip Barbara. Bar Skip, you, you say what you and then, and, and then he'll get, and she'll be mad at him. <laughs> you want to be mad at me? <laughs> you will be mad at me. I don't, I don't, I don't correct women. That's not what I do. I, I try, unless, unless I have to. Unless that, that, then that happens really. It happens really. It's a choice. Because, because I'm, I can save you untold, untold sorrow if you, and, 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 and your counsel doesn't always come when we set up a counseling appointment. It just comes when we're riding in the car talking, and, and I'll say something, and, and you'll go like, huh. 
And I realized that I get to say these things because it is my anointing to say these things. It's my anointing to say things that you can remember and to become a part of your life. I'm anointed for that. God gives me these things for you. And that I've told you, and everybody in this room has, you, I can, off the top of your head, you can name at least five or six, maybe ten things I've said to you over these last years that are linchpins in your life. And that's not because I'm smarter or wiser than anybody else. It's because that's the anointing on my life, and I pay attention to it. It's to tell you things that I, 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 Mark hugged me in, in, in the back of the room <coughs> yesterday. I said, Pastor, <coughs> And he does this often. He encourages me. He says, Pastor, the, the things that you have said, because um, I'm the man of my household and the patriarch of my family. And I know now what that means. Let me say to the men in this room, most of you, if not all of you, are the spiritual patriarchs of your families. Yes, sir. You are the top tier. In your family, you may have older, you, 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 you know, I'm, it, my dad, I, I respect my dad. My dad is the dad of the, of, of the family. That's, but spiritually speaking, I'm the patriarch of my family. Been the patriarch of my family for decades now. And my dad says that. I pastored my dad, and my dad said to me, and it said publicly, I've learned more about being a, being, you know, a husband and a father from you than you learned from me. Now, I corrected him and say, well, dad, I thank you for that. But you didn't, I had you. You didn't have a you. Your dad wasn't around. I had you. So what I am, if it's good, it's because of you. God works all things out well, doesn't he? Yes. But that's respect. That's honest. That's a respect for me. That's my respect for him. And, 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 and so the, you brothers, because of <laughs> much of it, some of it because of this ministry here, you know stuff. That, you, that, that your uncles don't know. You know stuff your daddy doesn't know. You walk, you walk in an anointing that, 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 that wasn't may, maybe even, a, wasn't even available to your dad. You're the spiritual patriarch of your family. And through you comes good counsel. We were in a meeting last night. In the middle of the meeting, I got, I got, a, I got this, this, this text. I get so many texts. Right? <coughs> it's for my, it's for my, my, um, whatever. It's my, my, son, my, son, my phone is not here, but it's, it's for my nephew. And my nephew said, "Hey, Uncle Chubb." I'm Uncle Chubby, by the way. Um, hey, Uncle Chubb, my mom told me to give you give you a call, and uh, because I need uh, and get some counsel for my life from you. That's my younger sister. You're the spiritual patriarch of your family. Your nephews, your sons, your grandsons will be calling you for life counsel. Your daughters, brothers, your nieces, your granddaughters, when they really want to hear which way is up, they're going to call you. It's got a clear blue. And all my nephews, they all, I'm all their pastors. I baptize them all. And, but, but I've been the spiritual patriarch. You are the spiritual patriarch of your family. You're probably the spiritual patriarch of your block. They may not recognize that, but, but when they have a conversation with you, they recognize it. They recognize the wisdom and authority you walk in. Because when you speak, your fierce conversation straightens things out. And everybody goes, oh, 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 okay. It's, we, it's over here. It's not over there. It's not, it's not over here. It's, it's there. Oh, just because you spoke. And you give good, wonderful counsel because you receive good, wonderful counsel. And God holds you responsible to receive and give good, wonderful counsel. It is, a, it is the kingdom of God. It's how things work. Not always preaching and teaching that you get the wisdom of, uh, of God from. It's sitting with a brother that you made a commitment. I'm going to sit with you once a month. We're going to have lunch once a month. We're gonna, you know, I may not even be on the schedule, but you just, it's just something that's important to you, so you make it happen. And while you're talking, man, you walk away from that, and, 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 and you walk away edified because it's how the kingdom works. The kingdom doesn't work other ways. I, w I sat in stadiums with, with 
the Promise Keeper Stadium was 70,000 men. Uh, we were at uh, the, the, the um, L.A. Coliseum. L.A. Coliseum holds like 110,000 people when you stuff them all in there for a football game. Uh, literally 110,000 people. That day, it was 60,000 people in that stadium. It was wonderful. But if I don't take that counsel, if I don't take that and take it back to my local church and get together with George, it was just a big old Christian party. Didn't make any difference. But if I took the counsel of those men who said, you need to take the reason, uh, the reason Coach McCartney and, and the leaders of Promise Keepers stopped doing Promise Keepers because they said, you local churches need to take this. We can pack up stadiums with 60,000 men. See, that's sweet humility. When you can put 60,000 men in a stadium and you say, well, we're not going to do this anymore, you're a humble man. Nobody does that. Nobody has that kind of power. And, and, and decides to not exercise it. Nobody. Now, I'm, talk, I'm talking mostly about Christians. <laughs> we stuff people like sardines in basketball arenas. But you cannot grow up in a basketball arena church. It can't happen. You cannot get the counsel that you will get here with six or seven of us. That may be a part of things, but that you can't grow up there. You need the counsel where there's a brother who knows you and knows your situation, knows your wife, knows your family, knows your kids, knows your dog and your cat. Okay? And can say to you, where were you last Wednesday? I mean, you have every right last Wednesday to be where you want to be. But if you're wise, you make yourself accountable so when the pastor's expecting to see your face and he don't see your face, you let them know why he doesn't see your face. That's safety for you. That's safety for you. Anytime this brother's not here, or, or, or can't, which is rare, but, but can't be here on, when, when, when I'm expecting him to be here every time. Every time. A couple of hours before, I get a text. Every time. Or if he think that I might not know, he, he told me, but he think that I might have forgotten, he texts me anyhow. Sometimes it's a long text. <laughs> I said, George is feeling verbose this morning. <laughs> you know, Pastor, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be down. I'll see you. I might see you next Tuesday. I might not see you. I might my guess the play. I said, thank you. Bro. That, 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 I mean, you're talking, you're talking about wisdom and accountability, the wisdom in that. That is, and it is not because for any, it's not for any other reason than love, honor, respect, and the valuing of what's kingdom. Amen. There's not a lot of that out there. Let there be a lot of that in here. Yes, sir. Because I've seen you brothers grow up yes, sir. and become true, true men of God. True men of God. I've had some I've had some knockdown drag out conversations with Dwayne. <laughs> Many men would have got up and walked out and never showed their face again. I've had some knockdown drag out conversations with my son here. And my son there. <laughs> and my son here. And my brother and my son there. And then my son in the back. And Many men, if not most, when they have the when I have those conversations with them, they don't come back because this room should be there should be men down the street. So you are wise and and uncommon when you receive good counsel. You're wise and uncommon when you read your Bible every day. Yes, sir. That's not common. You're wise, you're wise and, and, and uncommon if you're a pastor and you read your Bible every day. Pastors don't read their Bible daily. Every single statistic and study will tell you that, everyone. But you are wise and uncommon. You're kind of peculiar, too. The Bible says you are a peculiar people. Because you read the Bible every day? Really? Go to church every Sunday? Games on? You go to church? <laughs> yes. Games on. I want to see it. I DVR it. 
And even if I don't, that's, I catch the score late, that's fine. But I got to get the counsel that God has for me because what you feed is what grows. Amen? What you eat. If you eat spiritual food, you'll grow in spirit. Yes, sir. And God's expectation is for you to be full-grown spiritual men and not boys. The boy doesn't have to die. He does need to grow up. Amen? I'm not trying to kill a boy in you. Just trying to help him grow up. Like my pastors help this boy grow up. I finished with this. I said that a while ago. But um, The Lord's commandments, his order, his instruction are always the basis of good counsel. Um, when my nephew, the reason my sister told her son to call me um, for life counsel and it is because she knows that I walk according to God's commandment, his orders and instructions. Other than that, his son, her son coming to me for good counsel is just confusion. I can give him good counsel, but if I'm not living a good counsel, or if he hasn't witnessed me living, my, my nephew's known me since his birth. He's 29 years old. Other than his parents, that's probably the next person to hold him. And we've been close like that ever since. I'm the closest man to him other than his dad. And um, so he knows. She knows. My sister knows me as well as anybody in the world, except for my wife. And she switched. when people send their children to you, that's a trust that you have to be worthy of. That's what God expects from you. For you to be worthy of trust, he can trust you with situations. He can trust you with situations. He can trust you with people, souls and situations. And he will. So when you're young, young folks, younger folks and you, sometimes not younger folks and you, sometimes older folks and you come to you for counsel, that's great too. Because it's wisdom, this is a chronological thing. No, sometimes a younger man is wiser than the older. Sometimes. So the Lord's commandments, his order and instruction, the basis of good counsel. So if you walk in his commandments, his order and his instructions, then you are who God is going to use to give good counsel. He's not going to use people who don't walk according to his order or his authority or spiritual authority. And then because that's, that's confusing. Everybody gets confused. That counsel is always given and received with grace. <clears throat> Let me say this to you. Um, the Lord put on my heart as I was riding to church this evening, um, to, and it's something I don't normally do. So I did a little, little video and posted it. <clears throat> and it was just an encouragement. And look, I'm holding my phone, talking to the, 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 the camera there, and, and telling people this, and I always like to start, charity starts at home, is that, when you're under attack and when the things that are said and done as, a whole, as it pertains to you are less than God or godly, um, keep your grace. Amen? Amen. Keep, keep your grace. Keep, keep, keep your dignity. Keep your spiritual dignity, the dignity of the Holy Ghost. Keep it. Keep it. Don't. Don't get upset. Don't 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 let it don't let it overwhelm you. Don't don't answer. Don't respond in kind. Don't get ugly with people because they got ugly with you. Don't judge people because they judge you. Don't talk about people because they talk about you. Keep your dignity. You are the representative of Jesus Christ in the world. If the church gets ugly, where do men have to go? Think about it. If you get stingy, if you get judgmental, if you get angry and bitter, if you start cursing, if you start shutting people out, if you start separating parents and children, if you start, if you start condemning folks, and where does God dispense, who does God dispense his grace through? You've received grace. Saying it all the time. Amazing grace. 
How sweet the sound, saved a wretch like me. You should stay stuck on that line, the wretch like me line, so that we look at other people and we realize whatever wretched we see in them, we need to see it in ourselves first. And it allows us to, to, to deal with people mercifully. And it also allows us to ask for forgiveness. It allows us to give forgiveness and to receive it. It allows us to overlook a transgression. A wise man is slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. It is his glory. I think that's Proverbs 1911. It is his glory to overlook a transgression. This is his glory to see some to see a brother do something that, that he could have done and to and to this is glory to overlook a transgression. And when we become combative and Christians that 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 that, that challenge each other and fight with each other and gotta have our way, that kind of thing, then then the the the, the bounty of, 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 of what God wants to do with you through your good counsel and through your good, through your faithfulness, it, it's wasted. And God has to use somebody else other than you. Now, God's going to get it done what he wants to get it done. Yes, Is he going to get it done because of you or in spite of you? Yes, but he will never use ugly. <coughs> Another thing Grandma used to say and all the old ones used to say, God don't like ugly. I don't care. It does not matter to me whether you're right or wrong, but when you get ugly, you are wrong. You are dead wrong. The minute you get ugly, the minute, the minute you get ugly, the minute you get judgmental, the minute you go after somebody, you are dead wrong. God didn't deal with you like that. You're too busy crying for grace. I want to get grace and grace. I want to write a song about grace. Just sing all the songs about grace. We sing songs about grace all the time. A bunch of ungracious people singing about grace. Most of judgmental people singing about grace. God's like, God told the church, and he, he said, your songs make me sick. They make me sick. One of the churches, he said, I'm going to vomit you up. Your stuff make me sick. I, I would say, Lord, do it. I, don't, I do not want to make you want to vomit. I do not want to make, I, don't, I do not want to give you spoiled food. I do not want to give you bad fruit. Lord, I want to, I don't, your songs to me are driving me crazy. I, I don't want to hear them. There's noise up in heaven. And they're like, where's where that noise coming from? I'm that judgmental Christian right there. That Christian that just judged his wife. He judged his pastor and judged, his, and judged the pastor across the street. Him, the one singing Amazing Grace, that was like, <sighs> I hope God doesn't have to shut off my praise. So my counsel to you, beloveds, is that you are the sweetness of God. My friend wrote a song that says, I'm the righteousness of Christ. Um, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm the righteousness of God. No one can touch me. I don't have any fear, so I can just praise him. I'm the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God of the earth. You are what God is going to show people when he wants to show them righteousness. So keep it sweet. Ladies, and you in particular, you stop being sweet, you're a problem. <laughs> Women who aren't sweet, I'm sorry. I, I, I hope this doesn't sound sexist. You know, it's like men who are a little bit too soft. That's a problem, too. But women, women who are not soft enough, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't need to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with women. Me and, me and a brother can go out in the parking lot. We beat each other's brains out and go have a beer, <laughs> if that's what you drink. <laughs> And have a coke and and be okay but you can't do that with a sister so when you lose your sweetness and you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with men especially men in authority you you lose you lose you lose it is never good that's just basic Christianity 101 you shouldn't have to say that to people who think they're mature but you do Ladies, don't lose your beauty. Don't lose your, the beauty of, of, of who you are. You're not like us. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God you're not like us. I don't want to be around a bunch of mannish women. 
I don't, I don't, nothing, nothing makes me, <laughs> now I want to vomit yeah. that up. I don't, I don't want to be around a, 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 a bunch of aggressive women. I, mean, I don't, I don't want that. I, I, that's why we try to do things so that ladies, you, this is your church, this is your house. You, you don't need to do that. You don't need to muscle up. Thank you for not muscling up because that is, that is, that is evil. It is wrong. It is Jezebel. It's wrong. But what is right is how sweet you are. And you are a sweet group. Don't lose it. It's important. And by the way, be sweet. If you're those married ones, be sweet to your husband. If you're not married, be sweet to your pastor. <laughs> but more than that, be sweet to Jesus. Amen? Be sweet because that is your power. That's your power. Your power is being sweet. You don't lose with that. Your power, I'm not talking about your kindness, get, you know, your kindness getting used for weakness. God will deal with him. But don't you, you let God deal with him. Don't you be ugly. Don't. You lose all the power of what it is to be a woman when you get ugly. Oh, this is practical advice tonight, you know <laughs> I hope I hope it helped. I hope it I hope it helped. It may hurt a little bit, but I hope it helped. <laughs> you know? A lot of things that, that help hurt son. They they hurt first. You know? <laughs> Isn't that right, George? It hurt it hurts to get in shape. <laughs> if you're gonna do something great, I wanna run a hundred yard dash. We gotta get in shape first. I don't wanna get in shape. I just wanna run a hundred yard you're gonna get you're gonna get hurt all right. <laughs> you know, running a hundred yard dash without getting in shape. This is my job as, as your counselor is to get you in shape. Yeah. And it hurts sometimes, yeah. but it hurts so good. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So true. <laughs> Father God, in Jesus' name, thank you for the practicalities of what it is to be a Christian. We cannot get spiritual with you if we don't first just humble ourselves. And if we can't just be kind to each other, how in the world can we claim to love Jesus? The Bible says if I don't love the man that's sitting in front of me, I just know it's impossible for me to love the God I can't see. So, Father, if we, if we love the baby in the womb that we can't see, it's impossible. How, how in the world do we not, not love the baby we can see and love the one we can't? It, God, it's not possible. So let the contradictions die in the light of the truth. Let us sit under the authorities that you have set up, starting with your, your, your apostles, pastors, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Let us let sit under the authority of Jesus Christ and the authorities that he puts over us, and let, let us as the sheep of God sit under the men and women that you set over us because that's our blessing. Yes, Lord. That's how the kingdom works. Yes, we love you, God. Um, you are a relentless lover of men. Yes, and uh, you said to us, you said that if you're going to be my friend, you're going to do what I say. Hallelujah. Father God, you're the only one who can say that. Yes, um, and, but you did say it. So may people and men and women in my position... May they not have an agenda for the people of God, but to get them to Christ, who is their commander. Hallelujah. Dear God, thank you so much. Thank you, Hallelujah. thank you Jesus. Thank you. thank you, Lord. You are good and your mercy endures forever. Yes. Amen, beloved. Amen. 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 God bless you.